pedofiliáról még foglak kérdezni az interjú sorozatban később szem, de most kérlek folytassuk a fétisekkel, amik a narcisztikusokra jellemzők. BDSM kocsként találkoztam több olyan narcisztikus vagy pszichopata ügyfélel is, akik számára a szűk testre simuló ruházat, például latex, gumi vagy bőr vagy sí overall okozott elégtételt. Ez anyagok viselése adta meg számukra az élvezetet. Közülük van, aki igényli azt is, hogy fel legyen függesztve, és egy ilyen kényszerített pózban lebeghessen. Ez mitől van? Because when we are born, we have an assigned sex. We are born with a penis, so we are males. With a vagina, we are females. In very rare cases, we have both. So, but generally speaking, we have an assigned sex. Then we are brainwashed into believing that certain sex, is, a certain sex means certain types of beha behavior, certain inhibitions, certain things you should do and things you should not do, etc. So this is society's contribution. And this is when gender comes in. Gender is a set of behaviors, mores, conventions, norms that are associated with specific genital equipment. Uh, and that's where we got confused. We thought, we still think, that the genital equipment determines the functioning and the behavior. But actually there's absolutely no connection between the genital equipment and the, and the functioning and the behavior. We have societies, for example, northern Albania, where women function as men. They carry the male functions. They wear trousers. They sit in coffee houses and smoke. They manage the family's property. They assign work to the men who, at home, I mean. So the men wash the dishes and clean the floors and do the laundry and so on and so forth. And so, of course, gender roles have nothing to do with sexual equipment. If this is the case, then our attraction to the opposite sex probably is socially determined, not necessarily biologically determined. We have this tendency to believe that we are attracted to the opposite sex because that's biology, that's nature. I mean, have a look. In all the species, there's, well, the eukaryotic species, the high species, you have female and male and here, they mate, no? So if we mate, it means it's predestined and determined by, by nature. However, the truth is that absolutely anything can be a sexual object. Absolutely anything can be an object of desire. And absolutely anything can create sexual arousal and excitation. When I say anything, I mean anything. A roll of toilet paper, um, a ski, a ski uh, outfit, a latex uh, glove, the heel of a, of a woman's shoe, the woman's foot, uh, her nose, I mean, absolutely everything can and does create sexual arousal and excitation. So what is sexual arousal determined by? We have the, we have the sociobiological school which had become dominant in the last 50 years, and it teaches us that evolution determines why we are attracted sexually. Evolution wants us to carry our genes forward. So we have a whole complex set of mechanisms for determining the appropriate partner with whom we can propagate the genes. But of course it's complete nonsense. It's complete nonsense because we see that behaviors that have nothing to do with gene propagation, sexual behaviors, and nothing to do with gene propagation are extremely widespread. That would include, as I mentioned, BDSM, 15% of the population. Pedophile, pedophile fantasies, 20% of the population. I mean, the numbers are staggering. We are not talking about 3% or half percent or, or whatever. Staggering numbers. Um, and I think the reason sociobiology had become so popular is a Victorian reason, because we also tend to believe that the best arrangement for carrying genes forward and for sexual attraction is monogamy, which of course is not. Monogamy is, to start with, a historical aberration. So 
very short period, <laughs> in, and doesn't work, of course. Doesn't work. Adultery today is more common than marriage. Marriage rates today have fallen beyond adultery rates. So people go outside the marriage much more often than they get married. Um, and if we expand monogamy to include committed relationship, the picture is much worse. Much worse. Because cheating in, in committed relationships which are not marriage are twice to three times higher <laughs> than cheating in marriage. So we confused simply social arrangements like marriage, one-on-one, -on -one, monogamy, sexual exclusivity, with gender roles, a boy, should, a boy is a boy, a girl is a girl, with sex, which is equipment, and with sexual orientation, with sexual preference, which has nothing to do with sexual orientation, and finally, and above all, with sexual objects. The sexual objects can be, and is, and are, anything, literally anything. <coughs> the only uh, relevant distinction would be between holistic sexual orientation and partial or reductionist sexual orientation. So some people react to the totality. I mean, they're sexually aroused by totality. So if they're attracted to women, they would be sexually aroused by the totality of the woman, her entire body, her sense of humor, her intelligence, her conversation, her personality, by her totality. So they would be, that would arouse them sexually, excite them sexually. If they are attracted not to a woman, if they are attracted to an animal, they would be, but they would be reacting to the totality of the animal, the smell of the animal, the shape of the animal, the sound of the animal, and so on. If they are attracted to cars, and believe it or not, there is sexual attraction to cars, then they would react to the totality of the car, etc., etc. It's a total orientation, but it does not determine the sexual object. It can be any sexual object. But whatever the sexual object, the totality will matter. And you have people who react, who are reductionists. They don't react to the totality, they react to an element, component, ingredient, or aspect. These people are called fetishists. They can react to any dimension or aspect. They can react to the texture of a fabric. They can react to a specific clothing item, like boots. They can react to a specific body part, like feet. They can, but it will always be a part of. It will always be reductionist. So these kind of people, they would not be attracted to the totality of the car, they would be attracted to the tires. They would not be attracted to the totality of the woman, they would be attracted to her feet. They would not be attracted to the totality of a goat, they would be attracted to the goat's beard. I don't know what. They will be attracted to something, to an element. When you are attracted to the totality, the number of sexual objects that you can be attracted to is limited by definition. When you're attracted to, when you're a reductionist, there is no limit, almost, to what can become a sexual object. There's any element, any ingredient, any sub-sub part, any broken part, any, anything can become, can become a sexual object. So, in truth, the number of fetishes is far bigger than the number of holistic, totalitarian, if you wish, uh, people. This is the dirty secret of sexuality, that the idealized sexuality is that we are attracted to the totality. I don't know if there is such a person alive. People are never attracted or rarely attracted to totality. The overwhelming vast majority of humanity are fetishes. Even when you meet a woman, you, you um, reduce her to body parts. No one pays attention to the totality of a woman when he first sees the woman. He immediately, the man immediately scans the breast, the face, the feet, whatever, turns him on. Yeah? Um, and so fetishism is the natural state of sexuality. Not, the, not, not an aberration, not a deviance, not a perversion, as Victorian sexuality would have us believe, and we are still living in Victorian age. Fetishism is the normal state. And the thing is that 
as I said, fetishism is li virtually unlimited. So you can have people who are attracted to elements or components or ingredients that are unusual. It is not their attraction to a specific element that is unusual. It is the element that is unusual. The fact that they are attracted to something specific is not unusual. This is the rule. That's the common state. It's just that their choice of what to be attracted to is unusual. But if you read textbooks in sexuality and psychology, they will tell you that being attracted to a specific element is, is sick, is unusual, which is a lie, simple lie. Any sexologist will tell you it's a lie. But it's a lie we don't dare to discuss openly. It's simply a lie. I have proof also that it's a lie, if you will. I told you about the, the recent study, A Billion Wicked, Wicked Thoughts. They analyzed a data set of internet searches, what people search on the internet for sex. And it covers close to two billion people from every conceivable country and so on and so forth. And I think the, the initial data set was a billion searches. And it's the biggest study of its kind. Um, the overwhelming vast majority of people were looking for parts, body parts, clothing parts, parts. So the typical search is boobs or feet. No one would search for a beautiful woman who has a great sense of humor and very intelligent. Or a gorgeous man who understands the politics of the 20th century. There's no such thing. There's a search, big penis, or boots, whips. Yes, there are searches for this. Almost all the searches, we are talking billion, billion plus, almost all the searches were, were fetishistic in the classic sense. Almost all of them were fetishistic. They were looking for a trait, or specific trait or behavior specific part or specific material. These are the three fetishes, groups of fetishes. And that's it. That's a natural state of humanity. So when I hear about someone who is turned on by being, by wearing, uh, by being a horse, or someone who is turned on by wearing a ski mask, or someone is turned on, for me, that's the natural state of sexuality. I think for a man to be attracted to the totality of a woman requires inordinate effort and does not reflect sexuality at all, but political correctness in society and culture. Because it's not nice to be attracted only to her gorgeous boobs. You should be attracted to her personality. She's a human being. You know, it's not nice. It's politically incorrect. You know? So. I therefore don't think that there's anything special in narcissists um, dealing with fetishes and so on. There may be something special in the specific fetishes that narcissists choose, which reflect their, uh, for example, need for objectification or need for novelty seeking, adventures, propose the ski guy, or need for, or need for utter and total uh, surrender, which is when you become a pet. When your pets are owned, domesticated, controlled, and slaughtered. Yes, pigs are slaughtered. So, um, so this is total surrender. And this, again, is a vacation from life that we discuss. Uh, the moment of hiatus, the moment of uh, break that the narcissist needs very much because he, he doesn't have energy. He's depleted. Uh, narcissists, by the way, take these vacations without sex. This is called dissociation. The narcissist dissociation is because of that. The energy required is so enormous. The narcissist must take breaks from reality for millisecond, microsecond, second, so that he can, you know, so it, this second of dissociation is exactly what you give the narcissist when you discipline him. Or when you give the, when you give the narcissist when he becomes a horse. So this is the moment, this is the vacation from life. Only you are capable of giving the narcissist 20 minutes. And the narcissist gives himself 20 seconds in form of dissociation. So, but the fetish per se, 
is, should be, the, all, the, all the textbooks should be written exactly opposite, exactly reverse. The real abnormality, the real aberration is people who don't have fetishes. That's very worrying. These people worry me a lot. Because, for example, it's possible to construe, it's possible to claim that pedophiles are people who do not have fetishes. Because the pedophile does relate to the totality of the child. Most pedophiles, 80% of pedophiles, are not attracted to children sexually. They are attracted to the company of children. They are attracted to the control, to controlling the child. They are attracted to the child's personality. When you talk to pedophiles, why they were attracted to a specific child, they will talk about the child in terms of, of a lover. They would say he had, he had sparkling personality. He had a captivating smile. I couldn't resist him. He was so cute. He was so wonderful. It, pedophiles, actually, have a holistic, total view of sexuality where sex is not very important, it's just one element in a totality. And very few of them, that's a, re that's a reason why very few of them actually end up having sex with the children. Very few pedophiles actually have sex. They don't seek the sex, they seek the child. So this is an example of pathologized sexuality, sick sexuality. I would be very worried by people who are not fetishists. That's my view.